Happy Mother's Day. I t- we're in the middle of a sermon series called Roots. And uh, so I've got a sp- Mother's Day special for you today. We're going to call it a Mother's Day. Not just Mother's Day, but a Mother's Day. A specific Mother's Day, this message. But have you ever thought about what it's like? I mean, women, mothers, you already know what it's like to be a a, a day in the life of a mother. But for those of you who don't, salary.com helps us know the value of a mother. And they haven't updated it since 2018, but I believe that it's higher now than it was then. But have you ever thought about all the roles that a mother actually holds? If it were an occupation, let me list a few for you. Academic advisor, accountant, art director, athletic director, bookkeeper, buyer, CEO, coach, daycare center teacher, dietitian, educator, event planner, executive housekeeper, executive chef, facilities director, groundskeeper, interior designer, senior janitor, judge and magistrate, <laughs> laundry manager, logistics analyst, chauffeur, maintenance supervisor, market manager, network administrator, photographer, plumber, yes, public school teacher, psychologist, <laughs> recreational therapist, staff nurse, social media director, tailor, <laughs> tax accountant, teach vocational and work life program manager. They do all of these things for our children. And if you were to take the average income of all of those positions and multiply that by the average number of hours they work, which 96 hours I believe to be on the short side of hours they put in to these things for our families, their annual salary would be well over $162,000 a year. Mothers, I appreciate you. And I perhaps acknowledge the fact that I underappreciate you and your value and what you do. Mothers of the little ones here today. Mothers that are here, this is, this is a day which is a, a happy day for many, but can also be a sad day as we recognize mothers who have little ones who are already in heaven. But we also today want to recognize mothers who are spiritual mothers who may not have physical children, but I acknowledge and want you to recognize the influence you have over the people around you. Women, you are women of influence and you are spiritual mothers. Like it or not, you are spiritual mothers for good or for bad, and I encourage you to be spiritual mothers for good because we lay seeds and we lay foundations. I say we, but I'm not a mother. Uh, You are the mothers, so we honor you today. We think about Mother's Day as a day to honor And the reality is it shouldn't just be one day a year. When we really think about it, the day that you became a mother is your mother's day. So some of you have many more mother's days than others, like the Larsons. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But it's this beautiful gift to be a mother. So we thank you for being mothers to us. So we're in the middle of this Roots series, and it, it's fitting because we think about bearing fruit and, and what it means to bear a child, understanding that we have fruit to show, and we have fruit to carry, and we have fruit to sow. Uh, and it's important that we understand our roots. It's something that many of us want to know. Where did we come from? And it's gone to the point where People just, you know, spit in a tube and send it off to someone and then someone tells them, this is where you're from. The DNA tests or we go online to this heritage or familytree.com or whatever the big one is now because we all have this intrinsic need to know where did I come from? And, and it's something we're all passionate about. And the next movie that comes out that tells someone's origin story, where did they come from? We want to know what our story is. 
And really it should be what is his story. And that's what this series is about, looking at not just the fruit, but the fruit is because of the root. So we've been looking at the soil, we've been looking at the roots, we've been looking at the fruit and the branches in our life. And here's some key verses that we've been talking from. John 15, five, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. And without me, you can do nothing. Matthew 7, 16 through 20, you will know them by their fruit. Do people get bunches of grapes from thorny weeds or do they get figs from thistles? In the same way, a good tree produces good fruit and every rotten tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a rotten tree can't produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, you will know them by their fruit. James 3, 12 is another one. My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree produce olives? Can a grapevine produce figs? Of course not. And fresh water doesn't flow from a salt water spring either. What I've really appreciated about this series is that it's provoked conversations after church in families. And I've actually really been challenged by some of the questions that have come back to me throughout the week. And yes, you can do that too. And, and challenged me to dig a little bit deeper on some of this stuff. And I'm like, oh, I guess I'm not a botanist. I already knew I wasn't a gardener, but I'm learning more and more. So I wanna share some of these new un uncoverings and even realizations where maybe I wasn't clear enough or I see scripture even a little bit different. But uh, I thought about uh, the fig tree that when Jesus was leaving, he saw and it had no fruit and he cursed it and then they walked by it later and it was totally dead. Um, this tree was alive, but it wasn't producing fruit. It may have even been growing, but it wasn't producing fruit. And I thought it was important to distinguish the difference between the fruit of the spirit and the work of the flesh is that it doesn't say the fruit of the spirit and the fruit of the flesh. It calls it the work of the flesh, which is essentially working with no fruit, working for self-growth with nothing to show or to share as far as fruit. We talked about if the branches, if they are removed from the old tree and they are then put onto the new tree, then it doesn't produce the fruit of the old tree. And I came to discover that that's not the case that in fact, there's a tree in California that has 40 different fruit on one tree. <laughs> Absolute fact. And, but all of the fruit are of the same kind, the same family. They're all stone fruit, as in apricot, peach, plum. It has 40 different varieties of fruit on one tree. But the difference is that they're all good fruit. So if you was to take a branch from a type of tree that produces fruit, but the fruit are not healthy, and you took that branch and you put it onto the healthy root, it still produces the original type of fruit, but it's producing good fruit, not bad fruit. So it doesn't produce the fruit of the old tree. It does produce new fruit, but it's producing the fruit the way you're uniquely created to be. But that fruit will be the fruit of the spirit but it's gonna be healthy, tasty, it's gonna reproduce, it's gonna be satisfying, it's gonna be good size and good shape, it's gonna be free of defect and free of parasite because it's attached to the new vine. Disciples will be known by their fruit. Let me tell you, your actions matter. Living holy matters. Living a fruitful life matters because it's our fruit and our actions that are on display to our kids, to our coworkers, to our guests at church. We talked about how there's a difference between being cut off and cut back. God prunes us because he loves us. And he's removing parts of our life that are taking up energy, but doesn't produce anything. And we, he has to make room for the areas that are producing to grow. So 
that you can use your provision for fruitful, beneficial growth for his glory. Another question that I had, and this one was a really challenging question, was does God really only do things for his glory? I mean, that seems really conceited. I mean, I, I, have, I struggle with that. Surely he does stuff for love, right? I mean, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So he gave his son because of his love and not because of his glory. And as I started to dig into this, this became a, a, one of those things that's challenging to understand, but it's almost like saying, is Jesus man? Yes, 100%. Well, is he God? Yes, 100%. It's, it's a strange paradox that God does everything for his glory, yet he also does everything because of his love. One doesn't mean he doesn't do the other. So when I say all things are for his glory, that doesn't mean he doesn't do things for his love. In fact, it's because of his glory that he loves. And it's because he loves that he is glorious. The two are, are intertwined, that one doesn't mean that the other doesn't exist. Um, Revelations 21, 23, I shared this one last week. And the city that hath no need of the sun, there will be no moon either to shine upon it, for the glory of God did lighten it. So in the end, times, the city will be lit by his glory. But it goes on to say, and the lamp thereof is the lamb. So Jesus, in fact, is the lamp of his glory, the one that's shining his glory. And what is God if he is not love? The Bible says he is love. So God is love and he has no desire to cut us off. He found a way to graft us in. It's always encouraging when, um, as a pastor, you preach a message and then you discover after the fact that there's other pastors preaching a similar message at the same time because it's kind of confirmation that God is saying something not just to me, but he's saying something to the body of Christ. And so I got home and throughout the week, I saw it posted online, a good friend of mine who, who pastors up in Elgin uh, at Watershed Church, um, Scott Neubauer, he shared a message on fruit as well. And he said this line, he said, God doesn't desire to throw you to the fire and that's why he came down and put up a trellis. A trellis is like the wood crosses the frame that the vine can then grow up from. He came down and made a way so that instead of us being a loose branch that gets thrown into the fire, he found a way to graft us onto the vine and that we might grow up. Turn to your neighbor and say, grow up. <laughs> he came down and put down the cross, which is a trellis, so that we might grow up to him. and grow beautiful fruit. So are you ready for the origin story today? A Mother's Day. If you would turn to Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one. We're gonna see this day, this day a story of a woman that made room for growth that produces fruit. The first fruit. Luke chapter one. Chapter 1, verse 34 is where we're going to start. But this is right after the angel Gabriel came to Mary before she was pregnant, or rather she gets pregnant. Um, but she, he says to her, Mary, you're pregnant. Um, and uh, when it comes to the baby Jesus, God is the father. Um, and she, her response, she said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin and the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason also, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth herself has conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called infertile 
Well, now in her sixth month, make a note of that, sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold your bondservant. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed for her. Now, everyone say now. now. At this time, Mary set out and went in a hurry. Everyone say hurry. hurry. To the hill country, to the city of Judah. Sometimes God calls us to do things that seem to be impossible. And the question is, what do you do when he calls you to do something that is impossible? What do you do when he calls you to do something that is inconvenient, embarrassing, costly? How can this be? How am I going to do this, God? Was a natural response for her too. And the Holy Spirit was the answer and an example and a testimony of someone else doing it. Sometimes God calls us to do something simple, to bear fruit, and we don't want to do it. Mary was called to bear the first fruit, the first fruit, which would then become the sacrifice to redeem the rest. But for something to grow, something had to be buried. For a tree to grow, a seed has to be buried. Something has to be given up for something to grow. And this is what we would call a root awakening. She had a massive call on her life. Not just to raise a child, but to raise God himself. How do you do that, you know? Obey your elders. I'm God. I was in the beginning. <laughs> no. But the, the moment that the angel came to her is an interesting moment because we don't know much about this young girl beforehand. It doesn't say that after 40 days in the wilderness, the angel came and asked her. It doesn't say that she was fasting and praying and asking God about the direction for her life when the angel came and told her this news. The angel came and gave her this message at a very unopportune moment, an inconvenient moment. You know how sometimes a word is from God is when it's a time when you know you couldn't have possibly thought it up yourself. Like, I know I never would have thought that up. That's a temptation from the devil. But if it's to bear fruit for his kingdom and for his glory, and it's not something you would normally think of, it could be that God is giving you a calling at an inopportune moment. But she was there and she heard the voice in the middle of a normal routine day. What was she doing? I don't know, making food, doing the laundry. She was just a normal day to her. And God came down and spoke to her. She wasn't sitting waiting for this audible voice or this light to come. It was a normal routine day. And I wonder how often the Lord is trying to speak to us in our routine day, but our routine day is so filled and so cluttered and so distracted that every moment that we have where we've got nothing to do, we just, oh, I'm bored, I'm gonna flip through whatever pictures on Instagram or what's latest in the news, or instead of having space for him. Simply, Mary was doing what Mary does, and Mary, in her routine, 
had space. She didn't have to make space for God to speak. She had space. It wasn't filled with junk or clutter. It wasn't already occupied with something else. If every single minute of your waking life is cluttered and occupied, God could be speaking and you can't even hear him. Or we hear him, but we don't acknowledge him. I'll confess, I do this with my own wife when she'll ask me a question and I'm preoccupied. My response is, yeah, uh-huh, sure, okay, mm-hmm. Later on, where are we going? We talked about this. You said yes, sure, absolutely. Come on, man, I'm, I'm not the only one that does that, right? <laughs> Women, you, you have, right? I would love to see, I would love to see what you can get your husbands to agree to, like, Hey, honey, let's, let's go and buy a boat, a yacht. Sure, okay. You know, and then record it while they're not even paying attention. I think that would be hilarious. You know, that, that, that stuff will go viral, you know. Look what I got my husband to agree to while he was preoccupied. What things have you agreed to unknowingly? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, it describes that we have this treasure in jars of clay. Throughout Scripture, it describes us as clay pots. In fact, we're the clay in the potter's hands. Even in the beginning, he formed Adam. He formed man from dirt. And then Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry as an adult, his first miracle, he chose to use a pot to turn water into wine, a jug of mud he chose. I want to tell you today, he wants to use you, even if you're a jug of mud. <laughs> the youth are serving now, and it's such an encouragement to see them doing it. But I think that he wants some of you to do more as well. What is your jug filled with that needs to be emptied out? Because the churches have made it so easy over the last few years to get good word. I mean, when we think about 15, 20 years ago, before the internet even existed, to get the word, you had to be intentional. If you wanted to get extra scripture, you needed to not just dig it out yourself, but like, I'm going to see if I can order some CDs or cassette tapes. Whoever worked in the cassette ministry, right? CD ministry, duplication after church. Some of you all don't know the struggle is real back then. Now, we made it so convenient. Sermons online, and if it's, you know, it's online right after service, and then there's, you can choose whichever message from hundreds, thousands of churches around the world. The Bible app and every other app of the Bible is free and accessible. There has no, not been any greater availability of the Word of God in history and never been less accessing of Scripture in history as well. Why? Because we've been filling our jug with something else, filling our pots with something else. Too distracted. Another story about pots that sticks out in my mind is 2 Kings 4, 3 through 6, and this is just an abbreviated version. Uh, the prophet Elisha came to this widow and he told her to go and get jars from all of her neighbors, get lots of them, empty jars, and then start to pour oil into these jars. And when the jars were full, she said to her son, go bring me another jar. And he said to her, there's not one jar left. And that's when the oil stopped flowing. When he said, they're all full, we don't have any more space. That's when the oil stopped flowing. And I feel that often we limit God by saying, I'm too busy, I'm too full, I don't have space, I don't have any extra pots. It's time to get a bigger pot. A tree can only grow as large as the pot will allow. 
we got some different flowers and we we're looking for different pots and we saw some really nice big plants and uh, really small pots and we're thinking, why are the pots so small? Those things are gonna not be able to grow at all. We're gonna have to repot this immediately. And the answer we figured is, well, the people that are selling them wanted to find the cheapest pot possible <laughs> so they could make the most money and then make more money when you have to buy another pot from them. But your reach of your tree is only ever gonna go as far as the space you give for the roots. Get more pots, get a bigger pot. Don't try and find the smallest pot possible. God, you can fit into this little pot. I'm gonna give you this space from my life. But Mary, should let it be with me as you have said. We, meet, we need to prioritize our space for God first. God first, then family, then your calling in ministry. I wanna, I wanna distinguish following God doesn't necessarily mean that your ministry, God and ministry are two different things. My relationship with God is the most important thing and then my family is second. If, if I minister to the whole world and many people come to know him but my children didn't know him, I, I would feel that I failed. And so if anyone ever says, Stephen, I, I can't be on the worship team, I can't usher, I can't serve at the back, I have a family emergency, absolutely, I applaud you, your family comes before the ministry but I wanna make sure that while you're gone, you're still connected to God. God, family, calling and ministry. After that, work, your country, your play. These things are all further down, but the top three, we need to make sure we put God first and connect to God first because we need to have roots in his word. We have to have deep roots in his word so that the cares of the world won't rise up and choke out the word, causing it to become unfruitful. Mary had room in her life. She didn't have to make room. She already was there with open ears and an open heart and an open pot or open womb, you could say. What if Mary had said no? Have you ever thought about that? Sorry, God, the cost is too high. What if Mary had changed her mind partway through the process? I found it really interesting on top of hearing this message kind of being shared in different places, talk about roots and fruits and deciding to do a roots message on a mother and her baby and the testimony from the Pregnancy Resource Center, all of these things falling right at the same time as some certain information was leaked about Roe versus Wade. Is that not interesting to you? I don't know what it means, but I think it means that this is a timely message. There are things that we never, some of us, some of us have greater faith that knew God was gonna move on this, but some of us thought, this is just the way it is, it's never gonna change, we should have done something back when this all started. But in the same way that there is this shifting, not just with the way people in position of authority see it, but there's a shifting with the way this nation is seeing this topic. In the same way that Mary said yes, to this calling and yes to giving life and yes to bearing fruit, I believe that people are gonna start saying yes to the calling that God has on their life. Yes to bearing that calling, yes to bearing that fruit, yes to the way, yes to the truth. God has a calling on your life. Not a maybe, not some of you, all of you. Turn to your neighbor, look him in the eye, Say, look at me. Look, look at me. God has a calling for you. Tell them. 
God has a calling for you. Don't let your response be, ah, but the cost is too high. It's inconvenient. I ain't got time for that. Are we hiding from our calling with excuses of I'm not good enough? I can't do that. When the reality is you are good enough, you're just not willing to put in the work. I'll do it one day once I have more time, once I have more money, once I've got this done in my life, once I've achieved this status, once I've lived my life, once I've had a chance to live in the world, then I'll serve God. Is that what Mary did? No. No. That's right. Thank you. Someone that knows how to talk back to me. <laughs> it, it certainly wasn't convenient. I mean, a, a normal response would have been, okay, God, I'll do it, but let me get married first. I'm, I'm engaged. This is going to be really weird. Everyone's going to think weird things. Can you just hold off until I'm at least married? Did she really know everything that she was agreeing to in the beginning? I mean, there's that song, Mary, did you know that you're a baby boy? Often the lyrics to that song indicate she like knew absolutely nothing, but I think she knew a lot more than what that song lets on because later on she sings her own song that's filled with prophecy and scripture about the coming king. So what's her origin story? We don't know everything about Mary. We know she comes from somewhere where she's learned scripture, (laughs) somewhere where she's learned prophecy, so much so that it overflows out of her in a song that she sings. What is her origin story? She knew enough to say yes. She knew enough to know that people were not going to believe her. She knew enough that she would be ridiculed, that people would tell her betrothed, just put her away quietly. She may not have known that she was going to give birth in a barn. She may not have known that she was going to see her son die but she did know that her son would be her savior. And she accepted the call. I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me as you have said. I can do the hard things that you've called me to do. So back in Luke 39, Luke chapter one, verse 39, it said, at that time, do you know what that means? It means immediately. The angel spoke to her, and then at that time, Mary got ready and hurried down to the hill country where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Elizabeth was one of her relatives. It says she got ready immediately. How long does it take for us to respond when God tells us to do something? She responded immediately. I'm going to be closing here in just a moment, and then... We have some gifts for the parent, for the mothers. As I say this, God is calling some of you to do things right now. Some, some of you, God is calling you to stop doing some things. Immediately following service, you should go and do it. Some of you, you should be, just go ahead and do it now. It might be throwing stuff out. It might be clearing out stuff you've got in closets, just stuff you know you're not supposed to be doing. But others, you know you're supposed to be pursuing something for the kingdom, and you've held off from doing it. Inside, you have to say, let it be with me, as you have said, I am your servant, and then respond immediately. You are chosen. Yeah, I know you're tired. Yeah, I know you're overwhelmed, but he is your strength. I'm busy, then make room. 
Here's the interesting thing. Mary knew that she was in for a fight. She knew she was in for opposition. So where did she go? She went to someone who she know, knew would understand. Don't get around people that are gonna compete, compare, complain, contradict God's word. Get around people who will confirm and encourage and build up what God has called you to do. I know the Bible says that women should stay silent, right? But right here, Luke 1, 42, it says, in a loud voice, Elizabeth exclaimed, blessed are you, young woman, and blessed is the children you will bear. Be loud, be encouraging. <laughs> Lift one another up. It doesn't say that Mary went to her mother. It says that she went and ran immediately to her spiritual mother. And I want to recognize that there are spiritual mothers here and how important your role is. We don't know what happened to, to Mary's biological mother. Was she dead? Would she have not understood? It's not important. What she did here was she ran to a spiritual mother. Elizabeth celebrated Mary. Scripture tells us to be planted by streams of living water. So Mary, it says that she stayed with her for three months. What was the months that we talked about earlier? Six months. Elizabeth was pregnant for six months when the angel came to her. And it says immediately she went and she stayed for another three months. So she stayed with her all the way up to the time of the birth of Jesus' cousin. But she stayed there. She was planted there. She wanted to be around this encouragement. Living, where does living word come from? Living water come from? It comes from God's word. It comes from his people. His word can come from ourselves. And that's why she turned around and then she started singing God's truth over her. The angel came and spoke it to her. Elizabeth confirmed it. And then she sang about it over herself. She declared it over her own life. Right now, I want you to declare truth over your life. I want you to have truth in roots. I want you to have roots in your truth. Roots, connections, and relationships. Build them up before the storm so that you can hold on to them in the storm. Find your Elizabeth. Be a Mary. Be an Elizabeth. Make room for God's calling. Find your spiritual parent. Be a spiritual parent. Thank you, mothers and fathers who are spiritual parents in this church. Thank you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that you have knit us together in the tree of life. You are the vine and we are the branches and we get to bear fruit and we get to extend out into others and be a blessing to them and them a blessing to us. That we might bear fruit for your glory and your glory is your son Jesus who died for us on the cross because you love us. Your love is your glory and your glory is your love as we bear fruit for you in the unique way you've created us and called us with the flavors that we are. Lord, as we leave today, I pray that we would be able to express appreciation and encouragement and confirmation of your calling on one of the, another's life to recognize the goodness of God in each other to build each other up, encourage one another in Jesus' name.